For as long as I can remember, I have loved going to the movies. There is something so captivating and transformative about film. How a gifted screenwriter can turn incredible ideas into powerful words, summoning drama, humor, and conflict from the page like casting a spell. How an actor who knows their part better than they know themselves can breathe life into those words, creating a character who until that moment only existed on paper, and a performance with the potential to be remembered for generations to come. And how a director with vision and imagination can bind those rare elemental creative forces, fashioning them into a gateway able to draw you into whole other worlds, holding fast to your senses until the closing credits roll, and sometimes, if the job is well done, for far longer. My name is M. Glenn Gore. I'll be your host each week as we explore in depth the newest releases both in the theater and at home. You're watching In Like Glenn, and today we're discussing Winchester. The following video review contains spoilers for the film Winchester. Proceed with caution. Look, I get it. I do. Making a haunted house movie isn't easy, and making a good haunted house movie even less so. A number of accomplished filmmakers with their fingers firmly on the pulse of human terror have given us blood-chilling entries in the celebrated subgenre. There's Poltergeist, the unforgettable 1982 Toby Hooper classic about a suburban nuclear family terrorized by the vengeful restless dead atop whose unmoved graves their house stands. The Others, Alejandro Amenabar's exceptionally moody 2001 reverse ghost story, which proved maximum chills could be accomplished without expensive effects. And relative horror newcomer James Wan's commendable hat toss into the time-honored ring, The Conjuring, his authentically creepy 2013 contribution to the eerie breed. It is challenging work, and it really is okay if you don't happen to have that particular arrow in your directorial quiver, as is clearly the case with the Spree Brothers' new doesn't even qualify as a horror movie horror movie Winchester, a monumental disappointment of near galactic proportions that I am reeling from still, despite having watched four whole days ago. Based on a superb bit of early 20th century American arcana, the film attempts and fails spectacularly to tell the story of the Winchester Mystery House, a formerly seven-story monstrosity in San Jose, California, once owned by Sarah Winchester, widow to William Winchester, then owner of the Winchester Repeating Arms Company. They made rifles. That killed people. That would later haunt the hell out of the 161-room Queen Anne-style Victorian mansion, allegedly. Peter and Michael Spree gave us the widely acceptable Daybreakers, a 2010 examination of why a world ruled by vampires will always be a bad idea, and followed it up with a pleasantly sharp 2015 time travel jaunt Predestination, a film that is better than it has any right to be and way better than Time Cop ever could have been. So what then, if anything, is to blame for the drab, convoluted, and, you know, calamitous farce that is this movie? Let's start with the premise, or rather, the filmmaker's ill-advised decision to deviate from said premise. The real Sarah Winchester, who believed her family cursed by the spirits of those whose lives were lost to the weapons her company made, began construction on the house in 1884 after a medium advised her it was the only way to appease the departed. As it turns out, Sarah was apparently more interested in confusing the ghosts than appeasing them, as her solitary endeavor from that point until the day she died shifted to adding room after room onto the mansion in a never-ending renovation that would lead to such architectural oddities as staircases that lead nowhere, doorways to nothing, windows that only look out onto other windows, and entire rooms that couldn't be entered. She supposedly slept in a different room every night in the hope her phantoms would never find her and be forced to wander the labyrinthine corridors and passageways of her estate for all eternity. And if you're starting to think this sounds like an awesome idea for a movie, you'd be right. But maddeningly, that's not what this damn movie is about at all. In this film, Sarah Winchester, played vexingly by the irreplaceable Helen Mirren of everything you've ever seen, has set her sights on helping the spirits cross over peacefully. She achieves this by replicating rooms identical to the ones they died in. Don't even ask what she does with any spirits who are shot outdoors. The movie can't be bothered. At any rate, Revisiting the scene of their demise is essential to them reaching the afterlife, and while her desire to guide them into the great hereafter is noble, you have to ask yourself which idea holds the greater potential for a scary movie. Is it A, the heartfelt tale of mournful and kind-hearted Sarah Winchester who helps ghosts find peace by showing them how to cross over, or B, the terrifying story of Sarah Winchester, grief-mad widow and brilliant architect cursed with erecting endless mazes to trap and bewilder the phantoms who haunt her? Truth is often stranger and more interesting than fiction, and rarely more so than in this instance. I'll admit the set design here is very cool, but in a movie like this, the house itself should be a character. Winchester would have done well to take a page from the Inception playbook, utilizing the building's imaginative geometry to greater and greater degrees in order to thwart the increasingly more dangerous spirits that pursue her. The movie is ambitious enough to plant a solid idea early on, that being, 
A number of the more aggressive specters within the house refuse to cross over, and the only success Sarah has had in wrangling them thus far comes by sealing them away in rooms boarded up with 13 nails. Of course, all of these rooms line both sides of a single hallway deep in the mansion's bowels. Now anyone who's ever seen a movie, read a book, or really has just been alive for more than 10 years knows what's coming. This is what's known as Chekhov's gun, a trope that simply states, if you introduce a gun in Act 1, it had damn well better go off by Act 3. It's the most basic principle of setup and payoff. It's Holly's Rolex in Die Hard. Show him the watch. It's the compressed air tanks in Jaws. It's the stuffed clown in Poltergeist. Crossing the streams in Ghostbusters. Riggs's dislocated shoulder in Lethal Weapon 2. And the Rita Hayworth poster in The Shawshank Redemption. It's Rosebud. It is everywhere, a concept so universally well known that when the barricaded doors finally predictably open in Winchester, what happens? Well, if you guess nothing, two points. That's right, dear listener. When they're released, the most dangerous spirits trapped in the house, those so evil they can't cross over, not only don't do anything worse than reach out to touch an extraneous character and her son, they, wait for it, go back to their rooms and stay there once the primary spirit is defeated. And then the movie has the audacity to tease a sequel by showing one of the aforementioned nails falling out of a door. I have news for you, Winchester. You can't threaten me with ghosts you yourself have already shown me are harmless. That primary evil spirit, by the way, is Corporal Ben Block, played by the skeletal Eamon Farron. He was a Confederate soldier who took vengeance on a number of Winchester Repeating Arms Company employees because their rifle proved the superior firearm when pitted against the South's muskets. Block lost brothers in the war, so his ghost returns to Winchester House as the film's central antagonist. He is responsible for all of the movie's scares, and if you can't hear the air quotes around scares in my voice, they're there. The movie utilizes the jump scare almost exclusively, and it's always the same setup. It's deathly quiet, there's nothing there. It's deathly quiet, there's nothing there. It's deathly quiet, then suddenly there's a misshapen, disfigured face making enough noise to wake the people next door. This happens over and over until you're just angry about it. But let's address the other characters in this thing. Helen Mirren is, of course, superior to the material given her, but at no point does she look down her nose at the film. She mostly seems wasted here, her role feeling like the equivalent of me asking Leonardo da Vinci to paint my porch. Why she's in this is anyone's guess, but they were lucky to have her, even if there's scarcely anything of weight or depth for her to grab onto. Jason Clark of Zero Dark Thirty and Mudbound plays Prince Eric, Wait, let me try that again. Jason Clark plays Eric Price, a doctor in the loosest sense of the word, who is contracted by the Winchester Company to travel to the manor and assess Sarah to learn if she is still of sound enough mind and body to continue running the business. When we are introduced to Price, he is wallowing in a laudanum-induced stupor after having bedded not one but three prostitutes. And here is where the film takes its next bad step out onto narratively thin ice. Price is unlikable nearly from minute one, a coarse skeptic and con man with a drug problem and a pocket full of cheap parlor tricks masquerading as medical acumen. I might be wrong, but I believe the intent here was to make him flawed, but the gulf between flawed and unlikable on display here makes the Marianas Trench look like a crack in the sidewalk. Patrick Bateman is flawed. He's a depraved and narcissistic misogynist, but he's never unlikable. Travis Bickle is flawed, isolated, morally misguided, and volatile, but never unlikable. Michael Corleone, a stalwart war hero who reluctantly trades in his soul a piece at a time until he sits at the head of New York's most ruthless criminal organization. Flawed? Definitely. Unlikable? Never. Winchester's Eric Price is tacitly unlikable, uninteresting, and bland. The film teases us with his backstory, a valiant attempt to get us invested in an arc meant to make us believe he's grown as a person by the film's end, but it regrettably waits too long to reveal itself. His big secret is that he can see and therefore best the ghost in the mansion because his late wife shot him with a Winchester rifle before turning it on herself. Haunted by her memory and pronounced clinically dead for three minutes following the shot, Price carries the rifle shell that killed him, using it at the pivotal climactic moment to... You know what? No. Forget it. It doesn't make sense even by the rules the movie sets. The story is so Byzantine that when you reach its climax, you just have to accept it whether you want to or not. Sarah Snook of Steve Jobs and Not Suitable for Children is along for the ride as, I think her name is Marion Marriott, Sarah Winchester's niece. She somehow doesn't believe in ghosts despite her son Henry getting possessed so many times he should expect to be awarded some sort of prize. The child, who is creepy long before any spirits invade his body, loses all pigment in his eyes, sleepwalks off rooftops in the middle of the night, and opens fire on Sarah when he gets his possessed little hands on a loaded rifle. 
And I don't need you to believe in ghosts, but if your child poses an active threat to everyone in the house, maybe you should take them out of there. You know, like a good mother? Marion also suffers from tone issues. She is introduced to us as cold, distant, and stern, almost more schoolmaster than mother, yet she opens up to and trusts Price in an oddly brief amount of time, becoming a softer, more demure character for no discernible reason. This would be perfectly acceptable if there were actual scenes showing us this, and if there are, they are woefully ineffective. She and Henry offer little to nothing to the overall story, merely serving as targets for the damned, a fact made more irritating by the knowledge they can leave literally any time they want to. This isn't one of those haunted house movies where the protagonist can't get out. The doors aren't locked. They really can leave. They just don't. In the end, what could have been a compelling yarn about either restless, tormented souls learning to let go, or adversely, menacing spirits determined to rid themselves of the family who made them, is sadly neither. With characters less one-dimensional than paper dolls hauling around emotional baggage as captivating as the nutritional facts along the spine of a milk carton, and set in a location that would be fascinating if anyone involved had the slightest interest in actually exploring it, the film both fails to deliver the basic needs haunted house features call for, or elicit even the most rudimentary feelings of fear that are all but essential to any good horror movie. And for that, I'm giving Winchester one and a half stars. That's it for this week's episode. As always, thank you for joining me. If you enjoyed the show, please like, share, and subscribe, and follow me on Twitter for more updates. Until next time, you were just in like Glenn. This is normally where we do the honorable mention, but as this movie is so bad and I have nothing nice to say, this week I give you the first In Light Glen dishonorable mention. Now this one isn't exactly the fault of the movie, but it's something I've been encountering a lot lately, and it needs to be addressed. And by addressed, I mean gotten rid of. Before the lights went down, but right before the movie started, I was subjected to a 90 second promo, I guess is the word I'll use. A 90 second promo for Winchester, the movie I was about to watch. The movie I already paid money to see. This vignette was even hosted by the film's two directors. For the minute and a half that followed, they thanked us for attending, which is appreciated I suppose, but also unnecessary. My problem is they then began to show us how several of the effects and stunts in the film, which I've yet to actually watch mind you, were done. Cables, harnesses, rigs, the whole nine yards. Let me give you a nickel's worth of free advice. If you want me to believe and be immersed in the world you're about to show me, maybe you don't kick off the movie with a narrated short telling me how fake everything is. It even spoiled part of the climax. Why would you do this? I'm already here. You have my money. Just let me watch the movie. <laughs>